So we're in the Canongate area, the Canongate area of the Royal Mile. So we're still on the Royal Mile. The Canongate actually means the walk of the cannons. We're going to be visiting the Abbey, or what's left of the Abbey, later on in the tour, and this is what gives us its name. If you remember, on our last tour, we stopped at the World's End. And we mentioned that the World's End was there because that's what people had to pay to get in and get out of the city. Well, this part was a different borough. So people from here, from this part, had to pay to get into Edinburgh. People from Edinburgh had to pay to get out. Now, the, we're going to be visiting Holderood Palace later on, and I'll explain the whole concept of the cannons, and also we're going to touch on the Mary Queen of Scots, because we've had a few requests from a few people. They want the Mary Queen of Scots story, so sit back, relax. If you're in the east coast of the United States, hope you're enjoying your croissant, your coffee. If you're in the west coast, you're waking up a wee bit early. If you're in Europe, well, it's nearly time to go home, so nick off early from work. Tell them that Joe and Mike said you can leave early if you wish. And keep us tuned in, though. So we're taking a little walk around the Canongate here. The Canongate Church, or the Canongate Kirk, is the Queen's official church while she's here in Scotland. And she doesn't have a church actually in the palace itself, so she comes up here for her services. It's a pity it's close today because normally we can take you inside to have a look. Uh, but if you want to come outside here, maybe Mike can get a view of the Kirk itself. And this is where Princess Anne's daughter, Zara Phillips, was married. Now remember, Kirk is just a Scottish word for church. So the church itself dates back to the 1600s, the late 1600s. And there are some very notable people who are actually buried in the cemetery here. We're going to take you a little walk around the cemetery. I'm going to point out some of the famous people. I don't know if we get any economists who tune in to us here. I'm sure you're all familiar with Adam Smith. We uh, saw his statue when we were further up the Royal Mile. Well, Adam Smith's tomb is here in the, in the churchyard itself. And we've also got a lover of Robert Burns, who's also buried here. And some other notables. As we go walk around, we'll take to it. Now the good thing about on a day like today is we get more of the city more or less to ourselves. And this I always think is really good when you're doing tours in Edinburgh. Although it's raining, you do, it's less busy and you can go into more places. So Adam Smith, he was known as one of the great men of the Scottish Enlightenment. And it's fair to say that uh, the political and economic system that we live under in the Western democracies was actually comes from the writings of Adam Smith. It's, it's not difficult to overestimate the influence that he had in both Europe and North America. Of course, he talked about the invisible hand of the markets and his famous book, The Wealth of Nations. So people come here as a pilgrimage to Adam Smith. Adam Smith's grave is right here. And there is a little tradition. We've talked before about some traditions that take place here in Scotland. For example, touching the toe of David Hume or touching the nose of Greyfriars Bobby, which we do not recommend you do. We kind of emphasize this. But tradition here is that you throw one of the smallest coins of the realm onto his grave, and it's supposed to give you good luck. Whether or not you believe in that, the money gets collected up and given to charitable causes. I don't know if you can point out some coins there, but there are some coins lying on the grave. So that's Adam Smith, one of the notables here in the Canongate Kirk. We also have a poet. He's not very well known outside of Scotland. His, his name is Robert Ferguson. Robert Ferguson was a big influence in quite a few of the authors and poets of his day. He predates Robert Louis Stevenson and he predates Robert Burns. He wrote in Scots, not in English, not in Gaelic, but in Scots, which was an official language. However, he had a sad history. He was very young. He ended up in a place called Bedlam. Bedlam uh, was... Um, what we call an asylum in those days. I think he had a, a tipple, he had a little taste for the tipple. He ended up in the bedlam and apparently when, one evening he fell down this dark stairs and he died and broke, well he fell, broke his neck and died. And he was buried in a pauper's grave. However, such was his influence on Robert Burns and on Robert Louis Stevenson, they exhumed his body from the pauper's grave and they brought him down here to Canongate to be buried with the notables. 
and both Robert Louis Stevenson and Robert Burns left money to maintain his grave. We'll see a statue of Robert Ferguson shortly, but I think it's so atmospheric just walking through these old cemeteries when the weather's like this. I did mention last week that the Edinburgh International Festival, uh, the book festival particularly, has gone online. So if you want to Google the festival as well, you'll get some of our modern writers and poets. So this is the grave of Robert Ferguson here, the poet. So he was born in 1751 and he died 1774. So the stone was originally erected by Robert Burns and has been repaired and maintained by Robert Louis Stevenson and dedicated to the memory. They were said to Robert Ferguson is a, this was a gift from one Edinburgh lad to another. So always pay our respects to Robert Ferguson when we come through the cemetery here. Now the Robert Burns himself, <clears throat> he came from the west, he came from Ayrshire. And I'm sure everybody in the world knows at least, at least one Burns poem. And especially if you live in an English-speaking world, and at New Year, when you sing your song, Old Lang Syne, that's Robert Burns. Now he was a man who was able, through the education that was offered in Scotland, he was able to flit between different levels of society. He could sit with the best in the nobility and he could also sit in the pubs with the lowest echelons of society. He had this great ability to, to socially climb and be where, comfortable wherever he was, really a man who was comfortable in his own skin. And he had many lovers and he had many illegitimate children too. Now one of his lovers uh, had a pen name called Clarinda and they would, keep, they would send each other love letters using the pen names, but Clorinda died and she is buried in the cemetery too. We'll visit her grave in a minute, but I don't know if you can pick up on the hillside up here, you'll see this beautiful neoclassical building up here. It looks like a Senate building from Rome or for Athens. Indeed, Edinburgh is known as the Athens of the North because of the amount of neoclassical buildings that we have here. But this was actually an old high school. It's not been used for anything at the moment. There is uh, movement in Edinburgh to get this reopened and perhaps make it into the National Music School. I'm not sure as to where we are in that one, but we would like to save it for the for keep it an, as an educational institution. I think the citizens of Edinburgh prefer that. I know there was a company who wanted to build it into a hotel, and um, I don't think Edinburgh needs any more hotels. I think we're hoteled out here in Edinburgh. But it's a lovely, beautiful neoclassical building. Back in the end of the 1700s, we mentioned that they started to build the new town and the city fathers of Edinburgh wanted to make a statement. They wanted to look at an architecture that would really make Edinburgh stand out. So they opted for the neoclassical style. The neoclassical style you'll see a lot in the new town. The Gothic style you'll see a lot in the old town. So we've got two major styles of architecture here. So in the 1700s, they opted for the neoclassical style, and you'll see this, which is used mainly for buildings of educational purposes. And the Gothic style was mainly used for adoration. So Robert Burns, he had a, this ability to flip between different levels of society, but he also was a great influence on many, many writers. I mean, even if you, if you know John Steinbeck of Mice and Men, of Mice and Men is a line that comes from his poem to a mouse. When he was harvesting with his father, he was sorely um, upset when he saw that he'd actually destroyed a little mouse's house, um, or a little mouse's nest, and he wrote a poem dedicated to the mouse, and it's called An Ode to a Mouse. There you go. He also writes an ode to the haggis, so when we're having celebrating Burns Night in January, we always recite his poems, and we always toast the haggis when they bring it in as well. But he also has this let people, the way of bringing people down, uh, people who got above themselves. He didn't like that. Scottish people don't like that in general. If you get above yourself, people like, Scottish people like to bring you down, back to where you are. We always have this expression, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns. Uh, Agnes, you can translate that as well, which means we're all the same. Nobody's above anybody else. And we also have this other expression, where I grew up, they say, we know where you come from, which means like, don't get above yourself. So he was in a service here uh, in the church, in the kirk here, 
And he was there with all the ladies and all the finery and all the gentlemen all dressed up and all the well-heeled people of society in Edinburgh. And as he was sitting behind these people in the church, he noticed this one particular lady who was all, tr her hair was in tresses and she was all designed up, dressed up in a, in a finery and really showing off on a Sunday, because that's what they did when they go to church on a Sunday. They would sit in the front. It was an opportunity to show your wealth and your opulence and get really dressed up. But you notice that in her hair, there was a louse crawling around. She was infested with lice, this well, <laughs> this woman. And uh, he then penned a little poem called Ode to a Louse and sent it to her. So this is Clorinda's grave here. Clorinda was Agnes Craig McElhose. And it says, a friend and muse of the, Robert, of the poet Robert Burns. And they corresponded under the nom de plume, Clorinda. As I said, everywhere he went, he had many lovers. He was a poet and he was sexy and he knew it. And we celebrate his birthday every January. And I'm sure if you're Scottish and you're in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, wherever you are in the world, I'm sure you all celebrate Burns Night as well. And you must do it with a haggis. We won't tell you what the haggis is yet. We'll keep that a little secret for further on. But wait till you come to Scotland, we'll introduce you to the haggis. Another notable that's buried in here, I'm going to talk a little bit more <coughs> about uh, Mary Queen of Scots when we get down to the palace. But the palace was a scene of a very grisly murder. <clears throat> Mary Queen of Scots had a male Italian secretary called Rizzio. Rizzio was murdered in front of her, and I'll go tell you a little bit more about that as well. Now apparently his body was initially dumped by the murderers, but here in the cemetery at the Canongate, there is a tomb, or a vault, a vault, which states that this is supposedly where the remains of Rizzio are buried. Little gravestone here. And I really like the way they say it here in Edinburgh. They say, tradition says that this is the grave of David Rizzio, 1533 to 66, transported from Holyrood. Holyrood is the palace, and we're going to be going down there in a few minutes' time. I love the way they say tradition. We don't know if it's true or not, but tradition states or says that this is the grave of David Rizzio. Rizzio was Italian, spoke very many languages, but was the private secretary to Mary Queen of Scots. <clears throat> but it came to a bad end. So we did mention the grave of Robert Ferguson. And I've also built a little statue to Robert here. Come and meet our friend Robert. Dressed in clothes of the period. I think he was quite tall for the period. Or maybe I'm a bit short for our period. So we're back on the Royal Mile. And have a look here, Mike can pick this up. Every day in Edinburgh it's Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so you can see you can buy all your baubles, all your little tartan toys, open all year round. And I like this one here, I don't know if Mike can get this, of the Queen and the Corgi. We've got lots of little Christmas shops here in Scotland, in Edinburgh in particular. So let's take a walk and we'll go away from the main street. And look, you can turn around there. You can see there's the American Embassy there, Starbucks. So we've literally walked about 10 yards 
and the atmosphere just changes completely. This is a lovely little private garden, or hidden garden, I wouldn't say it's private, it's well hidden. It's open to the public. And it is a nice place to come on a dry day, even if you want to just come in here and read your book, the atmosphere completely changes. We often get asked when we're on tour around about Scotland, people say, oh my God, Scotland's so green. There is a reason why it's green. We get a lot of the wet stuff here as well. So we'll just walk in, we'll show you the little gardens, little private, and how well they're maintained, open to anyone. And it smells are glorious at the moment. So let's go take in the high street again. We'll get you down to the Palace of Holyrood with a few stops along the way. Now Mike can pick up over here. We'll see we've got this little primary school. I mentioned that this is a living city. So this is where the kids who live in this area. This is a local little primary school here. Now, I mentioned before about the unification, we just touched on it, the unification of Scotland and England. <clears throat> the actual countries unified under King James VI of Scotland. Well, I say unified, they unified under the crown, one crown. However, the nations were separate. So Scotland and England and Ireland uh, were all separate until up until the 1700s. So it was almost taken 100 years from King James VI. King James VI, you remember? He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and he inherited, or took over the English throne when the Elizabeth I of England died. But it wasn't until 100 years later <clears throat> that actually the United Kingdom was formed. And it was in 1707 where the great Nagood of Edinburgh actually signed the charter to dissolve the Scottish Parliament. Robert Burns actually wrote about them and he called them a parcel of rogues because they actually dissolved their own parliament. And let's just say they actually accepted the silver for that one. That's a bit of bribery went on. Plus a change, huh? Plus a change. Nothing changes. But one of the chaps who actually signed the document for the dissolution of the Scottish Parliament was a chap called Lord Queensbury. And Mike can probably pick up this beautiful ochre, ochre coloured building over here. This is Queensbury House. This is now part of the Scottish Parliament. But you had to be wealthy to have a building like this back in the 1700s. However, there is a story that I like to share with people which involves Lord Queensbury and his son. And I mentioned Lord Queensbury was one of the signatories to the dissolution of Parliament. On that day when he actually signed the dissolution, there were riots all over Edinburgh. The Edinburgh mob was famous. They'd be on the streets at the drop of a hat. So Lord Queensbury, after signing the documents, was going to be hosting a party here in his house. So his staff were getting the house already. And one of the things they were going to be doing was roasting a pig. Now Lord Queensbury had a favourite little scullion boy. A scullion boy was one of the boys who would turn the spit. He would work in, in, the, in the kitchen and he would be, his job was to turn the spit, to roast the pig. However, when Lord Queensbury came back from, down from the Parliament after dissolving it, he was looking for his favourite young lad. Couldn't find him anywhere. So they went round and round the house. Now, Lord Queensbury had a son. The son was criminally insane and he had been kept under lock and key. He was never seen in public. And we don't know whether it was because of the riots that took place here in Edinburgh and the stoning of the house. And we don't know if it was, if he was let out on purpose. But the son managed to escape. So when they went looking for the little scullion lad, the little 
chap who would be there to turn the, the spit. They went down to the kitchen itself <clears throat> and guess what they found? They found the son spit roasting the young boy, turning him around and roasting him on the fire. To this day, that fire still, the fireplace still exists and it's in the basement and it was used initially as a entry for a, well, part of the civil service. Now they've converted it into a bar. So this house has a very, very macabre history indeed. So we're in White Horse Close. And this is one of my favourite little places here in Edinburgh. And people walk past this all the time and it's a gem of a place to come into. We did mention in the 18, end of the 1800s, a lot of the uh, alleyways and closes were falling in into disrepair. Well, this one did too. This was falling into disrepair itself. Now, this dates back to the early 1600s, but it became a bit of a slum. But the city fathers decided they want to rescue some of these places, and they did a really, really good job on this little close here. The part in front of you, which you're looking at at the moment, you can might be make up the date. It's got the date of 1623 above one of the windows. This used to be an inn. And this is where, if you're going to get a stagecoach to London, or if you're getting a stagecoach back to Edinburgh, this is where you would pick up and drop off with the stagecoach here. Now, again, it is a living little village here um, so we do have to be very very respectful so when we tend to come in here we tend to come in in groups of like three or four maximum rather than um, more than this. Now there's some notable people who historically are very relevant to Edinburgh um, one of the chaps who lived here was a, a gentleman called William Dick that usually makes Americans laugh <laughs> his name was Bill Dick or William Dick and he actually was the founder of the Royal Veterinary School here in Edinburgh and the school was named after him and the school was actually known as the Royal Dick. There you go, a little bit of fun, fun facts along the way. So he uh, lived here in the 1700s right through to the 18. Oh, there's a sign on the wall there of him. The Edinburgh University was one of those, it still is one of the most famous universities in the world. Very difficult to get into. Um, so King David I was a man who was responsible of building the abbey here down in Holyrood back in the 12th century. His mother, Queen Margaret, <coughs> was very influential and, and a European type of influence as well. She was, uh, she was re reevaluating the Christianity here in this country. Um, she was making it a more of a European style. And it is said that she had been given <coughs> by the Pope in Rome a piece of the cross, of the Holy Cross that Jesus was crucified on. And when Margaret died, <clears throat> she passed the cross on to her son, David. Now they would be living up in Edinburgh Castle on the day. In those days, there was no palace here. This was the hunting grounds of the royals down here. So they would come down here hunting the stag, hunting the boar, and any wild animals that were here for sport and also for food and it is said <clears throat> I would love to say that it is said that King David was down here hunting and as he was hunting he saw this white stag or the white we call him a heart the white heart the white stag and it was said that as he was approaching it his horse had reared up and the stag, he fell off and the stag was going to kill him, basically, come in for the attack. But he, he always carried with him this piece of the Holy Cross. And one of the stories is that as he was lying there, he would reach into his satchel, take out a piece of the Holy Cross and hold it up to the stag. And then he said, by a miracle, the stag then backed off. Now he did consider this a miracle and as a result he actually decided to build the abbey here in Holyrood. So to this day when you come down to Holyrood if you look at the gates of Holyrood you'll see there is a symbol oh the Queen's getting some work done in our house at the moment above the gates you will see the stag 
with the cross on top. Holy Rood, Rood is an old Scots word for the cross, so this is actually the Holy Cross here. The Palace of Holy Rood House. A little bit of noise going on here, she's getting re tarmacked for the summer, so making a new Esplanade for her. Now, I don't know if Mike can, point, can come over to this side and we'll show you the Abbey itself, or what's left of the Abbey, which is to the left. It is in ruins. Hello. Hello, hello, I'm very well. It's, it's our architecture teacher, we just bumped in here. <laughs> Margaret, yes. thank you very much. Thank you, so you much. never know who you're going to bump into when you come to Edinburgh, aren't you? Oh, well, Look. only the hardiest out yes. in this weather. Yeah, well, we're broadcasting live, so you want to say hello? <laughs> this is Margaret. Margaret taught us our architecture when we were doing our blue badge course. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. We'll be talking about the blue badge. We'll just be talking about architecture. It's one of the favourite parts of the courses. I loved it. That's what I'm doing. Just said that. All right. We'll be doing it to the blue badge All right, okay. I'll be still talking about our neoclassicals and our different Doric columns. And now you're looking at William Bruce. I know we are indeed looking at William Bruce. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, wow. it's like we know everybody in this city. What a coincidence. I wanted to get too close to the building because it is a bit noisy. Um, but maybe Mike can point out the sea. You can see the ruins of the abbey. And then have a look at the building itself. Now the building does look very symmetrical. However, the building itself from the left across to the right, there's about 150 years between the periods. On the left towers, it is a rather noisy here. On the left tower, this is the original part of the palace. On the walls of the palace, you will see the emblems, or you'll get to see the emblems, of James V. James V's emblem was a unicorn, which is the symbol of the Stuarts. And on the other wall is the eagle. The eagle is a symbol of the de Guise family in France. Marie de Guise and James V, the parents of Mary Queen of Scots. So let's talk about Mary for a little while, shall we? Let's just say she didn't have a very good choice of men in her life. One of the most tragic, one of the most romantic characters in Scottish history, I'd have to say. <clears throat> when, she, when she was born, Henry VIII was the king down in England. Henry VIII wanted Mary to be betrothed to his little son, to unite the crowns. James V didn't want that. James V was a Catholic. Henry had already taken himself out of the Catholic family and had converted, and converted to Protestantism or created the Church of England. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't a union that was wanted by James V. So they said no to the marriage. So what did Henry do? Henry attacks Scotland. The War of the Rough Wooing. And he came up and he laid bare to a lot of the abbeys all across our border areas of Scotland, including the abbey here. Now James V died in one of the battles, <clears throat> so leaving Mary, a baby, to be crowned the Queen of Scotland. For her own safety and security, she was taken away to France to live with the in-laws, basically. So she lived in the French royal court. She grew up there. She spoke French fluently and she spoke Scots. She did not speak very good English. However, she was betrothed to the Dauphin, or their young prince in France. And when they grew up, they got married and she became Queen of France for almost a year. We'll just move up here a bit. We'll get out of the noise a little bit. For almost a year. However, the young prince died he died of an ear infection. In the meantime, Scotland had been going through its <coughs> iconoclasm, shall we say. It was changing from being a Catholic country to being a Protestant country. Mary's mother was ruling here in her absence. But when Mary's husband died, she was left without France. France didn't want her to be the, the Queen. It's unfortunate that she married into the Medici families. The Medici family was probably one of the most feared families in Europe at the time. So she left France, she came back to Scotland. She came back to Scotland, it really didn't want her either. 
Civil war was breaking out all over the place. But while she was here, she made a very strategic marriage to her second husband, Lord Darnley. Lord Darnley was English, so they thought it would be a good match. He was also Catholic. So they thought, all in all, it would be good to, get the, to unite the crowns. Now, Mary always had a larger say or a larger claim on the English throne than Elizabeth ever had. Remember, Elizabeth was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, and Anne Boleyn lost her head. So Elizabeth was always known as the Bastard Queen. Whereas Mary had both Tudor blood and Stuart blood. So her blood was purer than Elizabeth's. She always had a big claim on the English throne. So Elizabeth was terrified when Mary came back to Scotland. But Mary herself didn't play the game <laughs> terribly well. She married Darnley. Darnley was never made king. He wanted to be made king but they never ever made him king and he was really really envious in fact he was a bit of a brute and it said that he used to beat Mary up on a regular basis and Mary fell pregnant and Darnley knew that if she had a son he would even go further down in the pecking order just like today if another one's born you drop down so look at Prince Andrew and all the rest of them every time there's a new one coming along they drop down in the, the list or in line of the throne so I mentioned before about Rizzio. Rizzio was the secretary to Mary. Darnley was incredibly jealous of the relationship. Um, we don't know if she actually had a romantic or sexual relationship with Rizzio at all, but he believed that they did. And one evening, when Mary was in her bedchamber, which is one of the top buildings, top windows on the left of the tower, Darnley, with his, with his friends, burst into the room. Mary was there with her ladies-in-waiting and also with Rizzio. And they murdered Rizzio in front of the Queen. Now, I don't know whether it was because they wanted him to, she wanted, he wanted her to lose the baby or not. But she was very close to giving birth. <clears throat> it was very, very close to when she was giving birth. Darnley then took off. <clears throat> he went to his, ho his homelands across in the west of the country. But he got very, very ill. It's also thought that he had syphilis. Um, can't verify that, but it's, it's common rumour that he thought he had syphilis. The best physicians in the, in the country were here at the royal court. So Mary encouraged him to come back to Edinburgh. And she didn't bring him back to the palace. She was put into a house, not very far, about half a mile here from the palace itself. Now, Darnley kind of knew that people were after him. There were other people who hated Darnley, one of them being a chap called Lord Bothwell. Bothwell, Bothwell also had his eye on the main chance. They all wanted, Mary was a prize. They wanted to marry Mary. Bothwell himself is supposed to have abducted Mary. And in those days, if a woman was abducted and raped, um, they would have to marry. It was like almost an honor marriage she had to marry. So Bothwell saw Darnley are standing in his way. So one evening when Darnley was being nursed at home, you know what it was like in those days, middle of the 1500s, you got the odd keg of gunpowder just lying around in your kitchen, you know. Well, as Mary was leaving Darnley's house to come to her wedding, there was a huge explosion and the house blew up. Now they found Darnley's body and also the body of his equerry there was no scorch marks on it. In fact, the bodies had been strangled, so they knew that they were being attacked that night. Mary was implicated, as was Lord Bothwell. Civil war then broke out. Mary was captured and she was put on trial as such. She was forced to abdicate. Her young son, again a baby, inherited the throne and he went through a Protestant ritual rather than a Catholic ritual. Mary was held in an island in a tower further north in Scotland here for about a year. She managed to escape, raise her army, went into a final battle with her half-brother and she was finally defeated and then she went across the border into England and she was then, you cannot have two queens in the same hive so poor Mary ended up being captured, held in captivity for 19 years in Fotheringay Castle and the rest is history. Mary Queen of Scots 
and got her head chopped off. So that's the story of Mary. Now, if my history teacher had been there listening to this, I'd be chased up and down this high street with a big stick because can, you can't do the story of Mary in about five or ten minutes. But hopefully you got the main gist of it. Now, the last part I'm going to talk about here is on the street here, you'll see the letter S. Now, this was known as the Sanctuary House here. In fact, the Sanctuary is just the pink building just across the street here. Now, the S for Sanctuary, this is where you come. If you were being chased for your debts, if you crossed over here, you were safe. You were given Sanctuary, so your debtors could not chase you. However, you could not be chased for your debts on a Sunday. So at Sunday, you were allowed to leave, and they couldn't catch you for it. But you had to be back here by eight bells. So at eight o'clock, when the bells rang, you had to be back here. And I also have this wonderful image of people being chased down the Royal Mile. I know there's people trying to get back to Sanctuary, and people on the one side trying to pull you over. So you're actually caught back and forward, back and forward, being pulled. But if you got here, and if, I mean, that's, if, you, if you know your Dickens, you will know about the debtors' prisons, etc. But this also happened here in Scotland.